Um, my name's Ben, and I am a chef. That's what I do. So I'm just trying to remember now because less, things, less things have been changed. <laughs> yeah, less, okay, I'm definitely a chef. Um, so I set up Doughboy's Pizza, and then we did Patty Smith's Burgers, then we did Fush Nickens, which is a Taiwanese street food thing, and then we've done Ox Club more recently. So food things, food. So how did you first get into food? I started doing A-levels and then asked the person running the A-level school thing, sixth form, that's what they call it. <laughs> yeah, that's, it didn't last long, as you can tell. I said, do I have to be here? And they were like, no. I was like, ace, I'm not going to stay then, bye-bye. And then when I got a job in a kitchen and I was a KP and then it went from there, I said, oh, this is all right, washing up. Oh, I can put salads on plates. Cool, that's all right. Oh, I could put a lasagna in the microwave. And it kind of went from there, then realised that's not really cooking. Uh, and then got a job in a real kitchen. Um, uh, and it kind of went from there. So was uh, Doughboy's the first pop-up that you... That was your first venture, or...? No, before that I had a thing called the Wharfdale Kitchen, which is like a private dining thing. So I used to go into people's ki uh, people's kitchens, <laughs> just break into the houses and <laughs> just cook, cook things without them knowing while they're asleep. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't last long. <laughs> That's not that last bit wasn't real. Uh, no, so I did like private dinner parties. That's what I said, and then little pop-up restaurants in village halls around various places. And before that, I was a teacher. I used to teach cooking at a place in Bradford. Uh, and then before that, it was restaurant work and restaurant work and all that kind of thing. And then you had uh, it was it was it Doughboys or Patty Smith's first? Yeah, Doughboys was the first thing we did. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was, was that a pop up before it was in Belgrave or was that, was Belgrave the first testing? There was, um, yeah, no, Belgrave was the first thing. Oh, there was a thing at Beacons Festival two years previously, which I wasn't kind of involved with. That was a few, few other guys. Uh, and then they left, well, they stopped it, but they kept the kind of name, Ash and, and Cy kept the name. And then I kind of came on and like, oh, yeah, let's do this in right. the Belgrave. It'll probably be all right. And that was two and a half years ago? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're going to move on to a bit more about Hedrick House shortly, and obviously Ox Club. Um, before, when you were when you were doing a lot of the cooking in, in kitchens and stuff, chefs, chefs are renowned for not really eating that well outside of. Uh, uh, oh no! Oh no! Oh, it's not going well, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Someone change it. It's quite good though. If you'd like to get four, what's, what an exact amount? Four hundred eighty-six followers. <laughs> For free. Yeah, I, I might turn it off in a minute if it keeps going. No, on. I quite like it. It's good. I'm worried now. I'm worried about the downward spiral this is taking. <laughs> like now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, chefs uh, don't eat that well, kind of usually outside of the kitchen. Would you say like a lot of time? I know a lot of chefs that um, basically go home and just eat like beans and toast or something. Is that yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's pretty accurate until something really bad happens with your health, and at that point you turn yourself around. There's loads of these chefs who kind of you see them massive for ages and suddenly some, they nearly die and then they start <laughs> eating properly so I've not got to that point yet it's probably going to happen soon but yeah and I'm the same I think it's because you if you're cooking for other people then it's kind of you've got a re I find I've got a reason to do it and I love you make people happy and it's kind of I'll cook for my family and I'll cook for people if I'm on my own I'll just get a takeaway because it's so yeah. easy and it makes me happy to eat shit sometimes and I think that I think that's a common thing a lot. Yeah. and especially when you do the kind of hours we do in kitchens you kind of you don't always have time to eat or make time <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah what you can always rely what you can always rely on more this than is, anyone else this is so good well it's it, the best thing is it's my fucking sister <laughs> <laughs> my sister out, outed me as, a, as an adopted child at the last one so um <laughs> it, it's, it's going well. <laughs> As I said at the last one, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's making me feel drunk. It's brilliant. I'm not. Um, so, a bit more about the Leeds food scene. So, uh, recently, uh, Man Behind the Curtain has been like a big thing for Leeds, uh, particularly in terms of like, higher end restaurants. Um, what do you think that's the effect that's had on Leeds in terms of obviously like the stuff that you're doing isn't uh, like fine dining as such or anything like that? What do you, how that, has that affected Leeds? I think it just it's made people more aware of food again, uh, and that whole getting a Michelin star thing um, is brought like that restaurant's fully booked now for the rest of the year. I think mm. if you're lucky, you can get a table on a Tuesday at six o'clock in like five months or something. Yeah, um, and it's amazing. That's kind of brought. Uh, 
just more of an awareness of Leeds and what's going on, um, which I think is incredible. And he's snowballed now. He's doing all like so much stuff. It's oh yeah. Have you been? Have you been to? Yes, I went a couple of weeks ago for the first time. It's amazing, I think. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome, and yeah. you feel like you're in the future when you go upstairs. Uh, you got anyone been? Uh, so, man behind the curtains, where I think it's where Anthony's used to be, or uh, yeah, it's f- in f- is it flannels or flannels? Flannels. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Flannels if you're from Yorkshire. <laughs> the most overpriced clothing shop that no one ever buys anything from, but um, yeah. But there's a restaurant on top floor, and it's amazing. Um, but yeah, I think that was that was really awesome for Leeds to get that. Um, so, are there any of the hidden gems or, or places in Leeds that you think uh, need more recognition, like? Apart from obviously Ox Club, but oh, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> uh, um, places I don't know. There's loads of little places. Like I've got little favourites that everyone thinks I'm weird for. Like Tariq's in Headingley do the best curry. It's a lamb handy. It's called a lamb handy, and it's the most amazing curry. And the place is like, it's not a sexy thing. It's a real curry, lamb handy, and it's ut- utterly incredible. And the place is like, oh, is that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think you've got a. Uh, Dolan Twins oh, right. video. So the Indie Food guys. Cask, ch- <laughs> cask chat? I was actually looking at the Indie Food one, but like... <laughs> <laughs> Matt Dix. So Matt, uh, Matt, Matt sent you a text before. We, I don't know if anyone knows, but the last uh, Leeds Indie Food one a year ago, Matt came on stage and he, he, he did an interview and um, he basically just said some stuff that he really shouldn't have said and got, got told off big time. So his advice for you is don't say anything bad about corporates or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, don't slander any uh, popular tr- um, shopping centres. Obviously, <clears throat> well done for not saying yeah, Trini- I didn't, Trinity. Yeah, I didn't say Trinity, so that's good. I'm glad we got that one. I like Go how on. he's remote trolling is, though. That's good. Yeah. Um, is he watching? Anyway, so Hidden Gems. Let's yeah. Come on, we can do this. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, Tariq's does an amazing lamb handy. Um... Uh, this place like Cafe Moor, um, Caravan Sarai. Uh, I'll tell you what, that little, uh, where did I go the other day? Max's at the bottom of Butcher's Row in the market. A little Chinese place just oh, in yeah. the corner. They do rotisserie. And I just went, ah, oh, this looks a bit interesting. And they did, it was duck and rice. And that was it. And it was incredible. So there's loads of little amazing places if you yeah. kind of look past the McDonald's and the... Yeah. I hope we don't lose that because obviously the market's getting a bit, of a, a bit of a makeover and stuff. And one of the things that I was concerned about is it losing that character, losing that. Um, I don't know, like, you know, there's little hidden gems in the market that you come across. Like, there's like, so many stalls that I love in the market. I don't want it to lose that character when this new market version 2 opens in whenever. I think it'll be all right. I think hope, so. Probably. Hope so. The council are doing it, but that may be. Mm. Okay, so like people like Manjeet's <laughs> Kitchen are in there yeah. and she's ace. Yeah. And there's. Yeah, there's little people who are doing brilliant things. So hopefully, I think they won't ruin good. it with a Starbucks. This is true. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, but have we ever mentioned how good Trinity is as I a as a place it. to go? <laughs> it's really good. Oh, it's everything you could want in under one lovely glass roof. <laughs> it's true. So. So, uh, I think I think we're going to move on. <laughs> uh, have you got any? Uh, <laughs> have we got any food heroes? Any particular kind of chefs that you aspire to? Yeah, people like Thomas Keller in America. Everything he does is brilliant. Um, there's people in Leeds who are fantastic. Oh, I don't know, but yeah, it's people who who really care, and it's not necessarily food. Like you look at people like Matt. Mr. Maud, is he there? He's here. That'd be embarrassing if you weren't. That was good. Uh, people who've got a real passion for stuff, mm. I think, is an inspiration. Hearing Matt talk about the stuff, he you can tell he fucking loves coffee, yeah. and, it, and not in a weird way. Does he? He literally loves it. And the same, I went to meet. We met. Who did we go? Went to Hull. That was all right. And met uh, <laughs> the head brewer, the guy who owns Atom Brewery. Again, you can just you speak to him for like two minutes, you know, this guy really loves what he does. And that, if you can, I think you take that kind of inspiration from people like that who really, really care. Yeah. And you, you kind of channel even like 20% of what they've got into what you do, then something's, something cool is going to happen. Definitely. Um, so moving on to Belgrave. Um, Belgrave two and a half years ago, set up. <laughs> there you go. Is he here? You're hiding in a... I don't think so. I think we'd have heard of him by now. Um, but anyway, yeah. sorry, carry on. I mean, they're both they're both great, aren't they? So, it's well. 
Let's talk Belgrave very quickly. Go for it. <laughs> Matt Dix, who runs Lee's Indie Food, just so you know, he did like a year's worth of events with me last year, last year doing Patty Smith's. Uh, so he, he knows the insides. Yeah. Oops. He also does fish and. He, does, or he used to do fish yeah, and. Yeah, he, he was a street food uh, whore. So more free followers, don't worry about it. It's all good. Um, so Belgrave was the first playground for um, yeah, like your first ideas, I guess, Doughboys and Patty Smiths. Um, and then after that, um, it seemed like they were very uh, topical for where Leeds was at, at that time. Like, you know, street food wasn't really massive in Leeds, um, or at least it didn't feel like it as a, as a consumer. Um, so was that something that you like, kind of looked, looked at hard to try and figure out whether it needed to be burgers or it needed to be like pizza, or did it Not just kind of happen? Or? It kind of happened. It was just kind of... Oh, pizza's good, and no, some people are doing it. Should we? Yeah, let's do that. It'll probably work because people like pizza. <laughs> oh, it works. That's cool. Oh, burgers are quite nice. It was literally like that. It was kind of like, well, what would we want if we were having a? Oh, I'd probably quite like a burger. Cool, let's do that. And it, and it's kind of turns out we've been fairly accurate with our <laughs> predictions so far. Literally, that's there's no crazy research. It's just like, no. what do you want if you have it in a beer, in a beer, in a bar? You want a slice of pizza? It's easy. <laughs> it was literally like that. It's just thinking about what you want. Other, we're all humans. We all probably want roughly the same kind of thing. I guess as well, pizza and burgers go quite well with um, craft ales and stuff, which were yeah. also getting popular in Leeds at the time and, and all that kind exactly. of stuff. Exactly. And then obviously you, we're not the only people with brains. as people who've thought the same kind of things at the same time. So you've got other people doing similar stuff. And it, it's a logical evolution. There you go. Yeah. How hard is it to set up something like Pack Smiths and Doughboys? I mean, uh, maybe Belgrave. Did, did it being in Belgrave make it easier, or you know? Yeah, I think. Oh, we're massively lucky because we've. Uh, you're in a cool bar. People seem to know it. Um, you've got an audience. Or, but then again, we we did it as the Belgrave grew. We grew, so it's kind of like. We're kind of grown together, so it's kind of worked. But that's had you know that's made it a hell of a lot easier, I reckon, because we've kind of grown it as one big thing. Have you got any plans to take those um, outside of outside of Belgrave? And yeah, I mean, Patty Smith's, we've got a little thing in Liverpool, a place called The Merchant, for like a little two-month pop-up. Doughboys, that, we want to roll that out and take that to a few places as its own thing. That's kind of the, that's the mission for the next kind of th four or five years. Awesome. Um, and then sell it and be become a millionaire. <laughs> 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 own thing is a pop-up own thing is actually like a static restaurant that's that want, that's hopefully going to be standalone places hopefully the heading is looking possible uh, and then we'll see how it goes um, again we've not done it yet we've at the moment Doughboys has worked because it's been in Belgrave will it work on its own who knows you get through a lot of pizza though you know even on a quiet night there's still shifts a fair amount of pizza it's, yeah. and it's consistent it's good so I'm sure it'll do pretty well Jobs is good. Cool. I feel confident now. That's good. Yeah. You can you, you can do it. <laughs> Cheers, man. <laughs> uh, Hedra House launched at the end of last year. Um, yep. That seems like a, a natural progression almost from the Belgrave. Um, it seems like you've had, t uh, maybe not time, but it feels like you've executed a lot of the learnings from Belgrave in Hedra House, maybe? Yeah. I think Hedra was kind of like, because uh, it's quite taking quite a punt, kind of going, oh, Belgrave works. This is really busy. Mm. Let's open something really like just down the road absolutely massive as well yeah that's nearly that's bigger and let's hope that doesn't affect Belgrave and suddenly we're quiet <laughs> so that was a bit nervous nervy and then it's been fine so the idea was, was Hedro was let's do kind of a grown-up grown-up a bit more grown-up somewhere you'd go where I'd want to go I'm too old for this place man <laughs> um, and it's yeah it's worked so far just checking we're not being trolled we can crack on I think um, oh that's nice it's all good it's true there you go. Um, so, w what did you want to achieve with Hedra House that's different to Belgrave? Get free followers. I just wanted more followers, um, <laughs> ideally 400, uh, <laughs> and it not cost a penny. That'd be <laughs> ideal. Um, yeah, a grown up. It, it, you got to play with the spam, it's cool. Yeah, so we, it had to be grown up, and it had to be a little bit more. I think grown up's the word. Without, not that this place isn't, but yeah. it's just somewhere. Just a that different different kind of market. With I, I guess Ox Club formalises that as well in terms of the fact that, you know, Ox Club is a sit-down restaurant, whereas obviously you've got more street food vibe down here. And, yeah. And that's all that. Um, is, is it finished? Is, is, is version one of Hedra House done? Yes. Because uh, I know Maud have just installed the cold brew stuff uh, there. Yeah, that's seriously exciting. Are there any other installations going in, or is it just going to rotate them all the time? Or 
It, well, you said that about Belgrade. Like, oh, is it finished? I don't know. Like, do you know what I mean? It's still, they're just redone the roof. Like, everything's, it's, I don't know if any of these places will ever be finished. It's a con I think if, if anything is ever finished, it's probably, you might as well give up. I think you've always got to be, we are yeah. like a cliche pillock. You've got to always be kind of improving and, and Particularly with food, food especially, I think, or, or, and drink, you know, both very tre yeah. trendy industries and the fact that things come and go and you need to keep up, like craft ale still obviously massive in Leeds, but... Yeah, and you've got to keep things interesting for yourself and you've got to, because uh, you're the guys kind of running it and you're the, you know, your staff are the ones doing it on the ground. It's got to be interesting for them, so if you can change it and evolve, yeah, then everyone wins. So is that why Ox Club came about then? Because you wanted to have a go at making a, a you know, a proper restaurant. So it opened on the 3rd of December last year. Um, the launch went really well. Everyone was raving about it. Still are. But is that is that why you wanted to 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 start Ox Club because you wanted a more grown up restaurant in in the sense that we yeah it was again it was it's one of these things where like we a couple of us went to America went to Portland went to New York a bit of time in Chicago just to kind of it wasn't a holiday honestly it was a research thing and we we're just like what. Some cool stuff out here, and then and off the back of that, that was kind of well, we've got space in Hedrow House. What could we do? Let's get. A, we saw this amazing grill, and it came from there, and then it, it just kind of evolved and happened. There was no like, ah, oh, we must have a grill restaurant which serves. Blah, blah, blah. It was just like, what kind of food do we want to cook? Let's cook some stuff, and it it's kind of worked. Again, we've gone with what we want and what we want to eat, which maybe is a bit selfish, but it's kind of paying off because it turns out people have got the or they're kind of appreciating that the where we're coming from with it yeah and so far they kind of get it and it's I don't know if it'd be selfish in the eye of a chef though because you know that people trust your your taste and people trust your opinions on food really so um you mentioned the grill works uh grill works grill well you didn't mention the grill works grill but you mentioned the grill, grill which yeah. is for our, it is grill works isn't it yeah yeah is it from michigan I think, yeah michigan so did you see that grill and you thought that we have to base a restaurant around this? Like, this is just... We, we kind of saw it in a restaurant in Portland and went, oh, that's cool. It's, but it's, I don't know, if you, we've, we've got this grill, basically. It's like a, it's massive and it's a wood burn, a uh, multi-fuel, so we burn charcoal, British charcoal and wood. Uh, and we saw this this in this restaurant in Portland and it was belching fire in the corn. It was like this inferno of like, oh, uh, fire. And we thought, I never thought, oh, I want one. It was like, oh, that's cool. Until we got back to Leeds, we were like, oh, that grill we saw, uh, and then we we kind of yeah you've got a three month lead time for them to build it for you, and we had the Hedra House open in, in three months. We're like, uh, <laughs> mm, press the button, and we ordered it, and then it took it. Then we had to just work from there basically. So yeah, in a way, the grill came first, and like right, we definitely want a restaurant. We've now got a grill. Mm. Okay, that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice way of doing it, isn't it? Um, so yeah, impulse buy a grill and then base the whole restaurant around that. Yeah, which is. Perfectly logical, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Did you start to then uh, shape the whole menu around around the stuff around on that grill? Yeah, grill? and at, at, at first it was kind of like we'd never really cooked with that. I'd done wood, uh, cooked pizzas in a wood burning oven, and I'd done bits of grill stuff, but never on that scale. So we kind of tentatively did this menu that was kind of a bit of grill and a bit of stove, and then the more as we kind of opened and got a bit more confident, the kind of menu's gone a bit more grill, 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 and now we we're using it for all sorts of stuff from. Smoking, we'll cook beetroots and, and shallots whole. Oh, we'll do that. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we've, we've started using, utilising the whole grill for loads of different methods of cooking, and that's been quite exciting because it's a learning curve for us as chefs, kind of uh, seeing the cool things you can do with fire. There's more than just direct heat, there's little elements you can. You can leave things in, like slowly cooking. And you like can, the scallops that you have on the coals. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's it, and cooking directly on the coals. Um, yeah. Um, so just going back a little bit, what, like setting up a restaurant, setting up Box Club and stuff. I'm trying to ignore this kind of thing that's happening here, but we'll be all right. Um, setting up Box Club, like what were the challenges, you know, setting up a, a full restaurant compared to maybe setting up a, a, a pop-up or something that's, you know, arguably setting up Box Club has got uh, maybe a, a more technical menu than Patty Smith's or Doughboy's? Well, yeah, just exactly that. It's kind of getting the balance right of the menu, kind of getting some kind of format that people understand trying to convince people to share things. We gave up on that eventually because people just didn't, like I'd say 80% of people just didn't understand the idea of sharing stuff. We just right. like, okay, so people still can. Uh, so we kind of, that adapted. Um, 
What was the question? Hang on, I'm digressing. It was just about kind of what are the challenges to com setting up an ops club compared to a, a pop-up or a smaller. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so the menu, obviously getting that kind of balance right of interesting things that people are going to want. Cutlery, like, I know this sounds silly, I spent months looking for cutlery that wasn't shit and wasn't like, like you get, a, on a, this is on it, I've got a real problem because you've got a fork, you kind of want cutlery to feel like cutlery. You got to, do you know what I mean? You need to, you need to have a bit of weight. But it needs to not hurt your hands because some of them have a funny edge. Or you have a nice fork that looks like a fork, but the knife's got weird curves. And no one makes good cutlery anymore. And it took me so long to find it. So, yeah, things like that were what different you end up doing to getting with a paper plate or whatever we do with doughboys, you know. But what? that was all part of the fun, really. So what did you end up doing cutlery-wise? Oh, we found some eventually. <laughs> Literally, I'm not talking... This is, I think, a, a week before we opened, finally found some that was the right weight. And you'll go, if you ever come to the restaurant... and. <laughs> I love you, man. That's that's ace. It's a good point. Definitely a good one. I was competing. I spent three months looking for teaspoons. Who spends that long looking for teaspoons? Well, that's someone else. Yeah, I think ben. this this kind of ties in with with some of the food stuff we're going to be talking about because there's this. What are your thoughts on the spork? <laughs> oh, it's got its place. It does have its place. But this kind of thing with food's got so elaborate in places that stripping it back to being simple and knives and forks and plates have got so fucking ridiculous. It's a fucking fork, man. And it's got one purpose and it shouldn't hurt your hand. It should, you shouldn't even know you've got a fork in your hand. Do you know what I mean? You shouldn't have to consider it. And if I'm aware that this fork's a stupid shape, then the fork's wrong and it's annoying. So these, But it's the same with the food. It's kind of stripping it back to simple things that you don't... I don't want to be thinking about the shape of the plate or how many speckles it's got on it or whether it's a pretend speckle or... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway. Yeah. The yeah. fork should be an extension of your arm. Exactly. <laughs> just be, should just be. Does it pretty much run itself now or do you still have to be there quite a lot? Or? Yeah, no. We've got an amazing team. There's Ben, ben Eiley, who's a, another Ben, um, who's the head chef, who's amazing. There's a couple of Andys. Um, there's a, the, the team's ace and... They kind of just get on with it and I come in and we, we do little development stuff and we write menus together and everyone's so creative in that team that we kind of, we'll text each other ideas or we'll see stuff on Instagram and say, oh, how, do you, how do you smoke cream? Oh, look, I found this. And we'll just be, everyone's kind of bouncing ideas off each other. It doesn't always work. Most, like sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Mm. There's that kind of, there's a real kind of creative, fun kind of atmosphere. So it's not just my yeah. brain. It's kind of, there's five or six of us. How do you find the right chefs? How did you source those chefs? Uh, me and Ben worked together on some food schnicking stuff. That was one of our other foodie things we did. Uh, we did a ramen project together. Right. Um, uh, he was working at White Locks for a bit because Ash, who's one of the owners at Hedro, kind of he's part. He's got some fingers in White Lock pie, so kind of used White Locks as like a holding pen for Ben. Uh. Uh, so he stayed there for a bit until we opened. He we said, "Oh, we're gonna have a restaurant." At that point, we didn't really know what the restaurant was gonna be, uh, and it's just kind of stuck. And it's yeah. Um, so. I think the little touches at, at Ox Club say more than some of the bigger bigger things. So you've got like the olives on ice uh, with lemon or the chicken dripping, which is amazing. Um, but it's those little touches that I think def define the restaurant more than some of the, the bigger um, plates even. Um, how did you decide what kind of, obviously you mentioned the grill, but how did you decide what kind of restaurant you wanted it to be? Again, it was just through that's that thing of what do, what do I want from a restaurant in a selfish way or what do we want as a team? What those little things, those little bits that you get that you that are free. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like when you go somewhere and you get a bit of bread, it's like, oh, that's nice. Unless you go to Pizza Express or some of those places that go, would you like bread? With that kind of like, you're going to charge me for this bread. <laughs> I don't want that. I don't want that stress. I want oh, little bonus bits. Like and we did the chicken schmaltz, which is like a, it's basically a rendered chicken fat. Um, so it's like dripping, but with chicken. So it tastes like roast dinner, roast chicken dinner. So little things like that, little things that kind of make the night a bit more. Oh, that yeah. was that. I would, didn't. That wasn't on my list. It's I that excitement, that. though, isn't it? You want you want to be excited about something. You don't you don't just get served bread. You want to get, you want to have something where you're like, what the fuck is that? And how does that taste so good? And yeah, without intentionally going, how oh, we're going to blow their minds? <laughs> oh, let's render some chicken skin. <laughs> it just had to be kind of. It just again, it's just stuff I like. I, I love. I love that taste of you know when you roast a chicken if you eat meat and you get the bit around the pan and you go like, it's like mm. it's like chickeny marmite and it's ace. I thought, oh, let's do that, but 
you want to dip your bread in it. Yeah. Things like this is how the my, kind of our bread, well, my brain works is these little ideas that how, oh, well, and I don't know if other people want it, but then we do it, and most of the time it kind of it works. Yeah, I, th I think it's that simplicity there. I think you know the fact that you just obviously when you deconstruct it like that um, and, and say it like that is simple, and I think it's the simplicity that's one of the better parts of Oxclub really. You know, like a lot of the stuff you rely on uh, really good quality local ingredients and all that kind of stuff. Um, without saying like, ooh, local, but you know, it's true. Um, yeah. Like how do you kind of work with um, the, the uh, suppliers to make sure like it's, the, you know, the right ingredients We're or? Just communication, I ring them all the time. I've uh, got a company called Deli Fresh over in Bradford uh, and I'm a guy called Steve and I'm always on the phone to him. He goes, Steve, what's good? What? No, it's ringing. He gets really annoyed because we're constantly calling him. Same with our butchers as well. I just ring him. So what's, what's cheap and a bit weird that not people don't normally use? And they go, oh, intercostal muscles. <laughs> That's literally what he sounds like. <laughs> no, I'm not even joking. Oh, intercostal muscles. So these bits, I'm going to tell you, is part of the rib and it's not quite the meat in between. It's just underneath. Um, and no one uses it. And he calls them piano, piano keys, they call. That's a piano. Um, yeah, see so little things like that. So your butcher will send you some weird stuff, or we'll ring Liam at Tarbot's down at the market and go, "What have you got?" And he'll send us some cod tongues or cod cheeks or something interesting. And we'll try and turn it into something. So it's having that and getting that relationship with your suppliers, um, and where possible, we'll go to farm. We're like, we, where do we go? Uh, Grimsby Fish Market and met some of the the buyers. That was pretty cool. Um, our rhubarb man, uh, um, Robert Tomlinson, who also grows our kale and stuff. So we've got little connections with, with farmers, not to the extent that the Maud guys do. Because uh, some of the stuff, you can't get juice them artichokes at certain times of the year. But yeah. if they're coming from France and they're lovely, then we'll get them. Um, so how, how do you kind of... Like I, I I use Tarbot as a as like a, a, a normal person, not a restaurant. But I I think I think how do you start those relationships with those people? Do you just go to the stores and say, I want you to source for my restaurant, or like how does that start? Usually recommendations. So people will will because chefs are quite there's quite a little community, and we go, oh, yeah, have you used your fish man? Oh, Liam Tarbot. And then you ring them, they'll come down, and you can tell within. 20 seconds whether a supplier is going to be the right one for you. If mm. they're reading from a script, you're going, we source our fish sustainably and it comes from a boat called Stephen and <laughs> the fisherman was Dave. You can tell that he doesn't, but if you, if they've got a passion for the stuff they're selling, then you know that you're probably onto, the, onto a winner. Uh, the guys at Swaledale, uh, they're one of our meat suppliers. And there are these, a guy called George. You meet him and he looks like he's, he's lived on a hill for 17 <laughs> years. And he's... He gazes in the cattle's eyes, <laughs> and he's like, he's, but you can tell he's like, he loves me, and he knows how to treat it, and it's that <laughs> kind of thing. And the, again, R and J, no, it's true, honestly. And R and J, the guys over in Ripon, um, they do all their own, and you can just tell if they care, then there's a good chance the stuff they're selling is going to be ace. And if it's if you're getting a good quality ingredient, I know it's cliche, but you don't have to do a lot to it. Cause yeah. Let the flavours sing for themselves. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It's true. Cause you but you know, like steak in a box with chips and a bit of salsa verde is, is simple. And that's the yeah, it's meat yeah. and potato with some green shit on it. And it's lovely because you do it right and it's already nice when it comes in. It makes your job so much easier. I usually look for good quotes to pull out from these interviews and you've got, it's green shit and it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> meat and potatoes and green shit. <laughs> it works though, you know. Yeah. Um, so just a few more things on Ox Club. Like the the restaurant's not, you know, it's, you've not packed it with tables. There's a lot of space in there. It's not like you could have easily probably squeezed another four tables in there, maybe. I, I wish we could. But I was going to say, was that intentional? Because it feels intentional. It feels it feels like you've got enough breathing space, and it, you know, it's it's a weird shaped room, and we can't fit any more tables oh, in. <laughs> yeah, oh God, if we could cram them in, <laughs> cram them in, man. <laughs> No, it's literally, we're pretty much at capacity to how much you can get in. But that is an element. You go to the, some restaurants when it's it feels like they're just churning us in and out and packing us in and I can literally, I can smell him. You, you don't want to be to smell your neighbour. So it's, again, there is a it, there is a balance of getting that kind of space and not feeling like you're, mm. yeah, you're just on the conveyor belt of customers. So is one of the uh, like future plans, basically, what, what are the future plans? Is one of them to try and expand on the space that... that the Ox Club has, or do you want? To I don't. I don't think we can do much more with the space we've got. Then we might extend. We're talking about extending the counter next to the kitchen. So it's like a, a t currently you can get two seats um, next to where the uh, next to the kitchen. We're talking extending that to maybe five. So potentially it's not a chef's table, but like a kind of mm. a, a counter for brunch. Or if you can't get a table on Saturday night, oh don't worry, you can 
They do it at Zuko in, in Meanwood, and it's, it's, it's ace. ace as well. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you got a test kitchen, or is the test kitchen that that kitchen? Or? That is now the test. Originally, before the restaurant opened, because we didn't have a well, arts club, was delayed by a little bit because we didn't have gas and a few other key things you need to cook. Yeah. Um, so we hired a kitchen at Beckett's University, Leeds Beckett's at Carnegie Stadium. They've got this amazing test kitchen, um, and yes, yeah, so we hired that for like three or four days, and that was our our little test kitchen. Awesome. 